Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first of all ask you to again show your appreciation for the Right Honourable John Whittingham and the words that he has shared with us. <clears throat> Uh, I'm Callum Ross, I chair of the British Hospitality Association in Scotland. I'm on the board of the UK organisation. I'm on the board of Visit Scotland too, and I also run an independent hotel property called Loch Melfort, somewhere on the west coast of Scotland in Argyll. And uh, I'm pleased to say our next speaker has visited that area, albeit some years ago. I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our next speaker to you. Uh, she has been in... Uh, a, a, a Scottish Parliament, elected to the Scottish Parliament some 17 years ago, uh, re-elected in 2011 and then appointed to, as Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs. Only a few weeks ago, re-elected once again and this time appointed Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. It's a very important distinction which in Scotland we are uh, extremely uh, pleased about. Our previous Minister, Fergus Ewing, was, was Tourism Minister uh, working for a Cabinet Secretary Tourism is now at the big table, as we see it, uh, and uh, we're delighted that uh, we, we have that recognition by the government. In a few weeks since uh, the appointment, uh, the intention to engage with the industry, learn about the industry, work with the industry has been extremely clear. And the industry has also been uh, pleased to hear uh, some of our next speaker's comments on, on her, her views against things like a tourism tax and, and bed tax and the fact that the industry is too heavily taxed through VAT and other such things. If uh, you look at the government website, Scottish government website, which uh, details uh, all her responsibilities, I've picked out two or three which I want to highlight at the moment. Tourism, national identity, European Union and international relations. Isn't that a great portfolio to have today? <clears throat> with all the challenges that are coming ahead. Anyway, uh, I'm de delighted uh, to introduce to you now our Cabinet Secretary uh, for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Callum, for your kind words and also for the invitation from UFI. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to address this uh, British Hospitality Summit today, uh, and I'm delighted to be doing so so early in my role as Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. And I'm delighted that tourism has been added to my portfolio and to be the first uh, Cabinet Secretary for Tourism within the Scottish Government. Uh, and I think that shows the commitment that we have uh, to the sector. The Scottish Government has always seen tourism as one of our seven key economic sectors. It's vital to the Scottish economy and it shows the importance that we place and attach to tourism. I know from uh, Fergus Ewing, our previous Minister for Tourism, who many of you will know, that the British Hospitality Association works very hard, uh, particularly in Scotland. And our regular engagement with you is uh, of significant importance to the Scottish Government and I'm looking forward to working closely with the British Hospitality Association over the next few years to progress our shared agenda for the sustainable growth of the Scottish tourism industry. Uh, my overall responsibilities for culture, external affairs and tourism is an exciting role. Uh, there are clear synergies across the portfolios and industries uh, in helping ensuring and promoting Scotland and our place in the world. And of course, tourism is very much about encouraging uh, people to visit your country. And in the light of last week's EU referendum, I do want to stress that Scotland remains welcoming to all our EU citizens, which includes existing key markets such as Germany, and France. And of course, our Visit Scotland, Spirit of Scotland uh, advertising campaign, which I'll speak of later, is well placed to reinforce the welcome open for business message. We also remain committed to those EU citizens working in Scotland and in particular our tourism sector. And as our, the First Minister of Scotland said directly to those workers on Friday, they are welcome and their contribution is valued. And as you'll be aware, Scotland voted clearly 62% to remain in the EU and the Scottish Government is deeply disappointed by the outcome of the referendum. We met as ministers on Friday, we started engaging with stakeholders to provide that leadership, reassurance uh, and res resilience that is required at this time. And we also met as a full cabinet on Saturday. We're making clear to the UK government that we must be involved in the process leading up to the negotiation and the negotiation itself. 
I will also be engaging with the UK Government and others to ensure that the interests of Scotland's business community, including the hospitality sector and our wider stakeholder community, are recognised. And as we know, under the current UK Government, uh, the uh, tourism sector has the second highest VAT in the EU. They didn't, and they don't need to leave the EU to reduce VAT. <laughs> And if they haven't done it by now, why would MD be so optimistic to assume that it'd be abolished by any decision? Now, that is political, but we live in political times. And that is why, as part of my responsibility for Europe and external affairs, I'm conducting a series of meetings uh, in London uh, today uh, and in this hotel. I've already met with the Ambassador of Slovakia who have got the next presidency of the EU. We take our responsibilities seriously. We do want to make sure that we can chart a course in what is, I think, uh, uncharted territory so far to make sure the interests of Scotland are well protected and we can make sure that our business community in particular uh, have the opportunities that we can perhaps provide. So our objectives as a government is to protect Scotland's interests and explore all options to ensure ensure our place in the EU, ensuring our interests are served in the negotiations and the process leading up to them, and reflecting the views of sectors in these negotiations. Uh, we'll look at all options to deliver this, and that includes the option of Scotland remaining in the EU um, and the Scottish Parliament having the right to call a further independence referendum if required. But in the meantime, immediately we're having a debate in the Scottish Parliament where all parties are expected to uh, contribute constructively to how we take forward the country in the days and the weeks and the months ahead. But I, I want to focus as clearly as the agenda on uh, tourism as, a, a, as an engine of sustainable growth and job creation. We do need to look optimistically to the future uh, to benefit from the linkages that tourism has to many other key sectors, uh, very important economic sectors, for example, food and drink. And the latest Visit Scotland uh, visitor survey results and highlights the fact that uh, you know, landscape and scenery still remain the number one reason why people, why people visit Scotland, uh, with history and culture a very close second. And it comes back to the point I made about being welcoming and making sure that our welcome is strong, particularly in the weeks and months ahead. Scotland's reputation for friendly people was cited by visitors as a major draw, and as a result, nine out of ten visitors surveyed would recommend Scotland as a visitor holiday destination. And that's an excellent result. It highlights the substantial for potential for further growth, gives us an opportunity for the industry to work together. And in the words of the Scottish Tourism Alliance Tourism Strategy, to up our game collectively and turn our nation's many cultural and tourism assets into quality, authentic visitor experiences. The mid-term review of the industry-led tourism strategy was completed in March 2016 and launched at the Scottish Tourism Week in March this year. And it highlighted the good progress that has been made so far and enabled us all to align the tourism strategy more closely with the Scottish Government's wider strategic priorities. The findings pointed to where the tourism strategy has already realised value and it highlighted opportunities to for further improvement. These will focus on strengthening digital capabilities, a big theme of this conference, strengthening industry leadership, enhancing the quality of the visitor experience and influencing investment, specifically flight access and transport connectivity, built infrastructure, digital connectivity and business growth finance. And these are four drivers for change and improvement which will help us deliver on our ambitions. Digital infrastructure and connectivity and access to finance are rightly identified as vital to continue to grow the industry in that uh, growing co uh, competitive market. Uh, but also we need to remember at its heart, tourism is about people, skilled and passionate people. And that is why Skills Development Scotland is in the final st stages of refreshing the Tourism Skills Investment Plan with the industry chaired uh, Tourism Skills Group. So every sector in the Scottish Government's economic strategy has a skills investment plan. Tourism is the one linked explicitly to the midterm review of the Tourism Strategy 2020 national strategy led by the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Uh, I know Mark Cotho is somewhere here today. Priority themes emerging from that investment plan uh, for skills include development of management and leadership skills, digital skills that we referred to, and skills to deliver high quality customer experience and promoting sector careers. 
And as well as their support for, uh, for the refresh of the Skills Investment Plan, Skills Development Scotland has supported the delivery of successful projects, including World Host, the Scottish Apprenticeship in Hospitality and the Springboard Hospitality Awards. And as a later panel uh, deals with here, British Hospitality Association themselves have also been active through their big hospitality work. And I know that their event in Dundee in January this year uh, was attended by Annabel Ewing uh, in her capacity for uh, youth and women's employment. It was very successful matching employers with excellent candidates. In turning to uh, another aspect of our work, the themed years, I've had joint ministerial responsibility for Scotland's themed years programme for the last eight years. It's been designed to celebrate the very best of Scotland and its people, uh, launched as a legacy after the success of the Year of Homecoming in 2009. Uh, interestingly, the Irish copied it with their gathering, but that's flattery in terms of, uh, I think, reciprocating what we had achieved. Uh, the themed years aim to support and drive Scotland's tourism and events industries, both to domestic and international markets. And our aim is to create a legacy from the themed years, uh, and our partners have committed to focus on building business capability too. Themed years, though, also help bring focus on, on wider priorities. So in 2016, this year, it's the year of innovation, architecture and design, spotlighting and celebrating our great achievements in innovation, architecture and design. A great programme, great events happening, uh, really helping boost an interest in the content that people have been talking about. It's a chance to shine a spotlight on our achievements, but also look at the issues of fashion, textile, some of the other aspects of the authentic experiences that we've been talking about. It has events, certainly, and also it's supported by the centenary celebrations uh, by, of the Royal Incorporation of Architecture in Scotland and its Festival of Architecture 2016. So we're encouraging the tourism industry to think proactively uh, how the years might uh, go forward from a business perspective and how we can make that process easier for engagement. Of course, uh, we had the experience of the Glasgow 20th Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup in 2014, and they've helped to raise Scotland's profile as a world-class major events destination. And in line with our national event strategy, the government is, and our partners are committed to uh, further building and boosting uh, this issue. And in 2015, we saw the International Paralympic uh, Committee Swimming World Championships, the Open Championships uh, return to St Andrews, uh, and the World Orienteering Championships uh, also took place. Uh, we saw competitors there battle out in the world-class terrain of the Murray Coast and the Highlands, what a backdrop. We've also seen equestrian events and the World Gymnastic Championships at the SEC Hydro are due uh, and, and taking place and took place in October and November last year. And that's one of the most important events in the four-year cycle of the Federation of International Gymnastics. This year, uh, Scotland will host the Homeless World Cup in Glasgow, the Open at Royal Troon, the European Curling Championships um, at Bray Head as well. And looking forward, uh, we've already secured a number of high-profile events. Uh, the European Championships being co-hosted between Glasgow and Berlin in 2018, the Solheim Cup in Glen Eagles in 2019, and in 2020, Glasgow will be one of 13 host cities for the 60th anniversary of the UEFA European Football Championships, with four matches taking place in Hamden in the run-up to the finals at Wembley. So these events and taking events as, as part of our, our strategy cements our international profile as a world-class destination for business, events and tourism. And the events industry itself is estimated at £3.5 billion to the Scottish economy, and the ongoing development of a flourishing, innovative, competitive events industry will continue to create jobs, boost the economy, and it will deliver impacts and legacy. We've heard from the Secretary of State the importance of music, uh, recognising that uh, the role of music and festivals. 928,000 tourists visited Scotland in 2015 to attend a live concert or music. And we know that in terms of the revenue that this supports events like Homecoming and the Commonwealth Games, big impact. And of course, the Ryder Cup in 2014 at Glen Eagles attracted more than 63,000 visitors from out with Scotland, supported £106 million of economic activity for Scotland and £22 million for Perth and Kinross itself in the host region. 
And of course, Scotland is acknowledged globally as the home of golf, and no other country in the world offers such a diverse range of courses, from the open championships venues to the small hidden gems scattered across the nation. Uh, and can I may also suggest that you all watch out for the general release of the film Tommy's Honour. It's about Tom Morris's role as the founder of The Open. I saw the premiere at the Edinburgh International Film Festival the other week, and can I tell you, it is a fantastic advert for Scotland, as well as being a great story and film. In terms of our international marketing, we continue to work with Visit Scotland to ensure that our assets and our events are promoted internationally. And of course, that uh, Visit Scotland Spirit of Scotland global campaign launched in February by our First Minister uh, highlights the Scottish sense of humour, our warmth, our guts and determination. Uh, I'm sure perhaps uh, some fortitudes that are needed in the days and weeks ahead in the other part of my portfolio in terms of Europe and international affairs. Later this week, uh, I'll be launching the campaign's Visit Scotland, Spirit of Scotland uh, campaign uh, to encourage everybody to join online, uh, our online community, to share what they know and they love about Scotland. That spirit of Scotland, that human face, that spirit of all the characteristics are what will underpin that warm welcome that I talked about. I want to also mention air passenger duty. Uh, it's due to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, our airports are busier than ever. We want to see that success grow further for the benefit of passengers, business and tourism. Uh, we want to be consultative and collaborative. Uh, we have, as we have been with those uh, new fiscal levers that we've already uh, had devolved to Scotland. Uh, for air passenger duty, we have a stakeholder forum established, chaired by my colleague Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution. Uh, we had a policy consultation in the spring. Uh, allows us to take the next step to begin the process of designing and developing a Scottish air passenger duty to help deliver our objective of sustainable economic growth. We've had 160 responses to the consultation. We'll look very closely with that. We want Scotland to be an attractive destination for inbound tourism and we want to open up Scotland to key and emerging markets directly to capitalise on the opportunities that we all know exist. UK APD has been the most expensive tax of its kind in Europe. It continues to act as a barrier to Scotland's ability to secure new direct international services and maintain existing ones. So devolution of APD to Scottish, the Scottish Parliament will allow us to put new arrangements which can better support our objective to generate new direct routes and increase inbound tourism. Our plan to initially cut APD and then abolish it when public finances permit is a fundamental component to improving Scotland's international connectivity. And that connectivity, again, a theme of this conference, is to help us with that internationalisation of our image to encourage inward investments. And uh, our Scottish Development International strategic focus is to help bring new investors to help build our growth sectors. It has strengthened its focus on uh, attracting foreign investors and Scotland has been in a very strong position to date. And there's a forward pipeline of projects that we're looking at identifying opportunities in sectors such as digital technologies where Scotland is globally competitive. And that's all part and parcel of the overall economic environment. Uh, tourism is a vital part of our wider economic environment, but that wider economic environment has to have confidence, stability, and be an attractive place to come, study, visit, and do work and invest in. And we're determined that Scotland will be that country. So we want to make sure that we uh, build on that success, work with our enterprise agencies, work across government to create those conditions to provide that platform. We also believe as a Scottish Government in promoting fair work uh, as part of our approach to delivering inclusive growth. And I understand you know, it's a challenge for the sector, but the importance of fair working practices uh, is something that we can benefit from in terms of the quality of um, commitment that we can have from our employees in the sector. There are a number of organisations in the sector who have already uh, signed up to the Scottish Business Pledge or the accredited living wage our employers. And we're delighted that they've made those commitments. It recognises that fair working practices can make organisations more attractive and also more productive. 
So, uh, in coming to a, a conclusion in my remarks, um, I, I want to underline to you uh, that we do recognise the importance of the tourism sector to Scotland. Recently, recent industry figures confirm that visitor attractions in Scotland are enjoying a four-year period of sustained growth. Uh, many of our unpaid and paid attractions are reporting brisk business this year, underlying uh, our destination choice uh, and our quality experiences. More visitors are coming through the doors, helping stimulate economic growth, supporting jobs and the companies and the supply of goods and services to the visitors sector. And that's where the centrality of tourism in being able to actually generate the bedrock of growth for other sectors in the economy it has to be uh, argued and championed by whoever is, is your, your cabinet secretary or minister. We recognise the importance for the Scottish economy, but we also recognise that tourism helps showcase Scotland as a modern, dynamic nation with a rich heritage, a global reach, and confident of our place on the global stage. We're committed to working with the industry in Scotland and in the UK and across the globe. Uh, we want to enhance that reputation uh, as a dynamic, creative nation, uh, to be that world-class tourism destination and the perfect stage for events. So I know that Callum and his colleagues in the BHA in Scotland will continue to play a key role in our work towards sustainable economic development right across Scotland. I welcome the opportunity to work with UFI and the UK BHA on addressing the issues that affect the tourism industry at the UK level. I'm confident that we can work together uh, on all these issues. And as we face a future, perhaps with uncertainty, let us commit ourselves to make sure that our responsibility and leadership, whether it's part of the hospitality association or the tourism sector, is to make sure that we can deal whatever we have to with, I think, a sense of commitment, with a sense of st stability, reassurance, but also uh, an opportunity to make sure that we make the most of what lies ahead of us, taking everybody with us, and most importantly, extending a hand of friendship to both the visitors and the workers from the EU that are vital to our sector. Thank you.